Hello, everyone, and we're glad you can attend Attitudes Weekly ADHD Experts webinar. We hope that everyone is staying safe and staying well. Just some housekeeping before we get started. If you've listened to one of our webinars before, you know we offer attendees a certificate of attendance. When the webinar ends, a post-event survey will pop up. It will list three questions about the quality of the webinar, followed by three questions titled Required for Certificate. If you would like a certificate of attendance emailed to you, you should answer those three questions. If you don't want a certificate, well, obviously, don't bother answering them. Just another thing, there have been some sound problems in the broadcasts in weeks prior, but uh, we've been able to successfully edit out any sound glitches in the replays, just in case we run into that, so you know. So today we're addressing how to find some positivity in this incredibly unsettling time, while moderating worry, overwhelm, and anxiety. We conducted an attitude survey of our community during the last couple of weeks. We asked which emotions people are feeling. Leading the list was worry and anxiety, of course, and feeling overwhelmed and exhausted, followed by feeling sad or depressed and feeling lonely. Some respondents, believe it or not, felt calm acceptance or relief at the lack of daily stress. Chief concerns among adults with ADHD were managing their emotional state, managing unstructured time, and managing medication especially for those with comorbid conditions like anxiety or depression. The top three concerns for parent raising a child with ADHD were managing a child's remote learning, no surprise there, managing screen time at home, and keeping a child on a reasonable schedule, mornings, evenings, school time, etc. Thankfully, we have Dr. Ned Hallowell here to help us with these challenges. Most of us are very familiar with Dr. Hallowell. Either we have read his books, listened to his podcast, very popular podcast, Distraction, or one of his many talks about ADHD online or in person. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Driven to Distraction, which so many people have credited with helping them understand for the first time in their lives what ADHD is and how it affects their lives. He is also author of, I believe, 19 other books, and has five Hallowell treatment centers across the country. His new book, ADHD 2.0, should be out in early 2021. So please be on the lookout for that. So you can ask questions of Dr. Hallowell during his presentation, and we will try to get as many of them as we can after he finishes. If you want to download the slides of this webinar, click the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources on the bottom left of your screen. If you do not see the event resources tab, you need to refresh the page. So thanks for being here, Dr. Hallowell, and we're anxious to hear what you have to say. Well, thanks so much, Wayne, for having me. And as always, thank uh, the whole team at Attitude, uh, really the best magazine, not only in the field, but I think it's a model of its kind. It really is. Uh, sits in my waiting room, and when I had people in my waiting room before we went virtual, uh, it, it would disappear all the time because people would take it. The articles are chock full of practical, useful, you know, validated information. You have the best people in the in the field writing, and uh, and you do a spectacular job of editing it along with your your wonderful team. So I, I'm always grateful for the tremendous work that Attitude does, and uh, uh, I've been to your office. It's it's not plush, it's not posh, but boy oh boy, a lot of good work gets done there. So um, I know it's empty now because it's in Manhattan. Uh, let's hope and pray you're you're populated again soon. So anyway, the the new world. Just to give a, uh, I plucked this quote out of the New York Times just a couple of days ago. Uh, Michael Grossbard, chief of hematology at New York University's Langone Hospital, told me. Our practice of medicine has changed more in one week than in my previous 28 years combined. And I think that's, you know, from a doctor's standpoint, a, a pretty dramatic uh, account, uh, you know, of how uh, this pandemic, you know, just has turned certainly the medical world 
on its head. Uh, I have a patient actually who's a doctor in a pediatric intensive care unit in, in New York City, and uh, he, he told me he's 100% certain that he will become infected and he wishes it would happen soon so he can get over it and get uh, go on working. These are these are heroes out there. And, you know, we toss the word around hero, but um, and he said to me, he said, don't think I'm a hero. I'm not falling on any hand grenade. Um, I'm just doing my job, and, and I'd feel uh, bad if, if I didn't. Uh, he's saying I'm taking all the precautions, and uh, this is what you do if you, you know, if you become a doctor or a nurse or a, EMT or whatever, we have people out there truly on the front lines uh, in, in a different kind of war, a war against an invisible, lethal, deadly enemy. And uh, it has changed our world. There's no doubt about it. We're sheltering in place. We're wearing masks and gloves. We're washing hands more than your average person with OCD washes hands. It's, um, it's, a, it's a different world. And what I'd like to do is give you some perspective on how not to go cuckoo, you know, and not to not to just be so stressed out that uh, uh, you don't know what to do. So could I have the next slide, please? As I said, lives are being lost, jobs are on the line, marriage and, and families in conflict, disease and distress rampant, Uncertainty rules, and uncertainty is hard to live with, uh, particularly when you see the cost uh, being so dramatic and dire. And, and we we read about it, see about it all the time. It's like we're living in a reality TV show, only it's not a TV show, it's our lives and, and people dying. And, uh, and it's not just the death, but the jobs. Uh, incredibly difficult. I mean, lots of people out of work or furloughed or afraid they will be out of work or they will be furloughed. And furlough means, you know, you don't know if you're going to get your job back or not. Very stressful. And, and you know, and then you have to, you have to just uh, uh, stay indoors and, and you know, uh, it's a setup. It's a petri dish for uh, family conflict, marital disputes. You want to blame somebody. It's human nature. When we're stressed, we want to blame. And it's very hard to accept uncertainty. It's much easier to find a, a villain and blame that villain. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a real perfect storm for all kinds of emotional distress. Can we have the next slide, please? Now the Dow, not the Dow Jones average, but the Dow Doom average is skyrocketing. Dow Doom is distress, overwhelm, and worry. Distress, overwhelm, and worry. And as Wayne said in the poll they took of the readers, these were the overriding concerns. Uh, you know, our, our Doom, uh, Dow Doom quotient, if you will, is rising all the time. And, and you know, as that rises, we become more and more susceptible to disease, to making bad decisions, to substance use, to violent behavior, you name it. As the distress, overwhelm, and worry goes up, we are in worse and worse shape. But let's have the next slide, please. And, and there's a temptation to fall back on simple aphorisms, you know, that famous song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Well, that just sounds ridiculous now. It sounds absurd. Um, you know, I, I noticed this more and more. I was in the car today driving, and there was an ad for Subaru, Subaru, and it said, love is what makes a Subaru a Subaru. And I said, come on. You know, it, it, it's like the, the, you know, love, the people on the assembly line at Subaru are loving the, the car. I mean, it's just nonsense. Don't worry, be happy. Sounds like great. Okay, how? How? And, and uh, you know, these aphorisms just become so absurd, and, and they, they make you angry because they're ridiculously simplistic. Okay, I'll just snap my fingers. I won't worry. I'll be happy. Give me a break, please. I need something better than that. Okay, next, next slide. Okay, this is an important concept, the basic equation of worry. 
Now stay with me here. Increased feelings of vulnerability combined with decreased feelings of control equals increased feelings of toxic worry. So the more vulnerable you feel and simultaneously the less control you have, the more your feelings of toxic worry will increase. So the two variables you want to operate on are the variables of vulnerability and control. The next slide, please. Now, I mentioned toxic worry in the previous slides. I want to contrast that with good worry. Good worry, you need good worry. If you don't worry at all, we call that denial, you know, and that's a big problem in its own right. So good worry is basically problem solving. You're worried about the pandemic. So you set about trying to uh, solve the problem, you know, and, and it, that's what we need to do. Good worry is a, is a great advantage that humans have. We can reflect, anticipate, uh, remember, you know, using, looking back at the past, learning from it, anticipating the future, planning for it. That's all good worry. But when worry becomes toxic, then it becomes counterproductive. How do you recognize toxic worry? Usually it's you're alone when you're doing it and you become immobilized. <clears throat> it freezes you up far from problem solving. <coughs> you're feeling, excuse me, don't worry, I don't have the virus. <coughs> it's just my chronic uh, uh, you know, frog in my throat. Um, you, you become paralyzed, immobilized, uh, you, you globalize, you catastrophize, the end of the world is nigh, and it can happen in seconds. You can just go into a complete downward spiral and feel totally overwhelmed, completely at a loss, uh, and you have your, yourself and your family and your town and your business succumbing uh, in a matter of minutes. And, and it, it, it's a, it, it is what the imagination does when it, when it turns upon itself and, and creates uh, terror, terrors out of, out, of, uh, out of reality. So what you want to do is try to hold on to good worry, problem solving, and get rid of toxic worry where you become immobilized, frozen, and, and completely wiped out by, by the force of worry. The next slide, please. So what you need is a plan to decrease feelings of vulnerability and increase feelings of control. Uh, try to hold on to that because this really works. So whatever you can do to decrease feelings of vulnerability and increase feelings of control. So on the first one, decrease feelings of vulnerability. Think to yourself, what are the pockets of security you can depend upon? You know, we're all feeling vulnerable to the virus, to job loss, to economic uh, problems. What, what are the things you can depend on? What are the pockets of security that you've got? What's still in your cupboard? Is it a relationship? Is it, is it, a, uh, is it a, uh, a retirement fund? Um, is it various material assets you've got? Um, is, it, is it faith in God or some other kind of spiritual connection? What are the pockets of security that you can depend on, the sense of, well, they can't take that away from me? Um, you know, in my own case, it's my love for my wife and our three children. And uh, the dog that we used to have, my son took the dog. But, um, you know, I, I can take that to the bank. And, and my, my love for life. You know, I can take that to the bank. It's sort of my my natural bubbling enthusiasm to live. It, it, go down the list, and and it, it, your my backyard, the tree in my backyard, the trees in in our front yard. As you start compiling this list of of, of pockets of security, you're amazed how how long it can become. What are you grateful for? And you want to stock that cupboard. You stock that cupboard with as many items as you possibly can things that can't be taken away from you, things that you know that you know you feel secure in, that, that are your, you can st store up your, your cupboard with, with, with stuff that you're, you're, you, you love, you care about, that sustains you, and is not going to be removed uh, by, by this crisis. And, 
and and take stock of that cupboard and 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 you know look at it you know i i am in touch with my kids two of them are in new york city and of course i'm worried about them but we speak on the phone every day uh, you know you, you want to keep physical distance but not social distance and then what can you do to increase feelings of control what can you do to increase feelings of control and um, if we get to the next slide, I'll, I'll say more about that. Oh, and let me just say, why do I say feelings of? Instead of vulnerability, I say feelings of vulnerability. And instead of control, I say feelings of control. Because it's your perception that makes the difference. The external reality is almost irrelevant. It's how you feel about it, how you feel about it, how you feel about the pandemic, how you feel about the uh, potential job loss, how you feel about your grandmother in a nursing home, how you feel about what you, you name it, but it's how you perceive it and what happens to it in your imagination that turns it into something terrible or something uh, that you can work with. The same thing with feelings of control, feelings of. And typically in moments of dire stress like we're living in, people minimize their control. They, they feel as if they have much less control than they actually have. And they feel much more vulnerable than they actually are. But it's how you feel that matters. So if you let yourself, you can work yourself into a state of abject vulnerability and complete lack of control. And that's a mistake your imagination makes. It's a mistake you, your perception makes. Your your imagination is playing a trick on you. You're forgetting about all the controls you do have. You're forgetting about those pockets of security that you can put in your cupboard that I just mentioned. You're forgetting about your assets. You're forgetting about your strength. You're forgetting about what you've got going for you. You're forgetting about the, the people who are looking out for us in many and different ways. You're forgetting all that. And you're just drilling down on the, on the, the most terrifying elements. Well, that's a trick your imagination pays, uh, plays on you. And, and it's, it's defensive because your imagination doesn't want you to be caught unprepared. But you can go way too far in that direction and way exaggerate how vulnerable you are and way exaggerate how little control you have. So the next slide, please. Okay, a three-step plan. This plan I have been working on developing for my entire career and, and it, it really it really is solid it really does work these three steps put Prozac out of business believe me if you if you if you follow these three steps and I, I worked them up uh, why did I work them up because I'm a big warrior myself so I needed something that I could use in my life and then I could recommend to my patients friends and family and and uh, these three steps, uh, honest to gosh, they've, they've stood the test of time as I've recommended them, and uh, I'll go through them one at a time. Number one uh, is the most powerful force in life for pretty much everything that's good. It's the force of connection. At its most distilled, we call it love. And then as it, as it pans out, uh, I call it connection. So the force of, of positive affiliation, of, of positive connection. Um, I call it vitamin C, the other vitamin C, and it's more important than ascorbic acid. If you don't get enough of that vitamin C, vitamin connect, you just don't feel right. You feel unmotivated. You feel lethargic. You feel uh, kind of empty. Like, what's life all about? Well, life is all about deeply held, cherished connections. So you want to stoke those, particularly now, stoke those. Stay in touch with the people you love. Reach out. You can do it remotely. You know, you don't have to go outside, but, but reach out, connect, um, you know, uh, walk through the neighborhood, uh, uh, you know, with the mask and all that. But, uh, uh, and, then, and then call pe people. Call people you haven't talked to in a long time. Take this opportunity to forgive someone maybe you've been feuding with. Uh, uh, stoke up, replenish, refurbish, renovate your inventory of connection. And just think of how vast it is, connection to friends, family, places, memories, connection to clubs and teams and organizations. Um, you know, connect, my favorite, of course, is the dog. I always talk about dogs. They're the greatest connectors in the world it's for no 
accident that God spelled backwards as dog. And, uh, you know, while we mentioned God, you know, I happen to believe in God. But then, and people will say, how can you believe in God? I say, well, you believe in love, don't you? And everyone says, yeah. I say, well, God is love. So if you, if you believe in love, you believe in God. It's just another word for, you know, so, so where you find love, you find God. And so the, the more you can bring that co- connection uh, to whatever it might be, loving connections, uh, the, the stronger, the better, the less vulnerable, the more in control you will feel. Uh, vitamin connect. And my motto that goes with it, never worry alone. Never worry alone. It is when we worry alone that we catastrophize, globalize. That's when toxic worry sits in. So, so you know, you're, a, you're an open petri dish for toxic worry if you're alone. So that's why maintaining connection, particularly these days, is so critically important. And, and don't think watching CNN all day is connecting. It's not. It's, it's, it's just stoking your imagination with, or whatever channel you happen to watch, you know, that, that – uh, just collecting the, the grim news every minute of the day is a very bad idea. It just fills you full of negativity, and that's not good. So by, by connecting, I don't mean watching the news. I mean talking to people over the telephone, over Zoom, however you want to do it. All my practice now is conducted over Zoom. It's an incredible thing, you know, and, and uh, it works really well. Okay, so step one is to connect. Reach out, make contact, however you want to do it. Number two, get the facts, get the facts. Toxic worry is almost always rooted in wrong information or lack of information or both. And we live in a time where, you know, there's facts floating all over the place, but you have to figure out which is, which are the true ones and which are the wrong ones. And then, you know, try to, try to get the information you need. And again, you, you can't ever nail it down completely, but, but get enough of the facts. Uh, that you're, you know, you're on solid ground instead of believing every rumor, believing all the hearsay, believing the hype, you know, believing the, you know, one side attacking the other side, and you know, next thing you know, you're you're just in in, in a in a mishmash of anger and, and distortion. Try to sort through all that and find reliable facts, and then once you have the facts, make a plan. Making a plan is what life is all about. You know, we keep making plans until our final plan fails and we die. You know, so we don't have that one. We don't have that one beat as of yet. But uh, life is about making plans and then revising them. Why is having a plan so important? Because remember those two variables, vulnerability and control. When you have a plan, whether it works or not, when you have a plan, you feel less vulnerable and more in control. When you have a plan for how to apply for a mortgage for your house or now how to get groceries without their being contaminated or how to take care of your grandmother in the nursing home, when you have a plan, you will feel more in control and less vulnerable. And then when it doesn't work perfectly, as plans inevitably do not work perfectly, you revise it. You go back to step one, never worry alone. You talk to an expert. You talk to a friend. You get on the line. You get a few more facts. You get some new ideas. So this is how you can apply for that loan. This is how you can apply for unemployment. And this is the new wrinkle. You get some more facts. And then you make another plan. The worst thing you can do is to sit cowering in a corner, just waiting for the next bad news to hit. Um, I have a patient who used to say to me, I wake up every morning wondering what bad thing will happen today. And I would kid with him about it because he was a wonderful man. But, uh, you know, I said, I failed you. I, I don't want you waking up that way. I mean, you know, and, and we would bat that back and forth as to whether I was uh, going to be able to turn him. And uh, I, I think he did. I don't think he wants to admit it, though. Anyway, when you have a plan, uh, you're in a much better position uh, to <clears throat> to make progress, and you know once again to to come out of the uh, hyper vulnerable state, and 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 also take uh, as much control as you can, knowing that no one ever has total control, but you wanna you wanna do everything you can to give you and your team, your family, whatever, uh, enough control to be at your best and be most effective. Those three steps, 
connect, never worry alone, get the facts, make a plan. And you do that over and over again, and that's called living a successful life and certainly minimizing the impact of toxic worry. Next slide. This is just a catalog of connection. I, I love connection so much, you know, just in case you, you wondered, what, what do I connect to? Of course, you see what I put number one, a dog. <laughs> it, it, you can have a cat if you, if you must, but uh, a, a dog is, you know, they're at the top of my list. Then family and the past, you know, take a walk down memory lane. It's a great time to do that. Remember the people you've loved. Remember the people you've lost. Remember the childhood. Remember the lake in the woods. Remember the mountain you climbed. Remember the birthday parties. Remember the first girl or boy you kissed. Remember, you know, whatever pops out of your, your memory. Your connection to beauty, you know, to art, to uh, uh, the, the beauty of nature, the be beauty wherever you see it, and how wonderfully empowering connection to beauty is. Your favorite food. Uh, tonight, my wife is going to make beef stroganoff, and that is one of my favorite meals. I've been looking forward to it ever since this morning when she told me she was going to make it. Your favorite TV show. We're really into TV these days. I, Sue and I, my wife and I, are watching so much TV. Now, some people might think that's not very... Uh, not very high class. Well, we love it. We love TV and uh, 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 crime dramas, romantic comedies, uh, anything. Uh, don't feel bad about watching a lot of TV. It, it does not have to be Shakespeare to be really fun and useful. And movies, of, of course. Can't go to the movies right now, but someday we'll be able to go back to them. Your favorite place to relax. For me, that's bed. I love our bed. It's a huge king size bed. And I love to lie on that bed and watch TV. That's pretty much my, my safe place. You know, I talked about uh, pockets of security. Well, that bed for me. And the word that I always use is cozy. It's so cozy. Find cozy places these days. Find the cozy place. For me, it's our bed. For maybe you, it's your easy chair in your, in your living room or or maybe it's a, maybe it's a place in your, in your uh, den, whatever. Uh, a place to relax. Neighbors, again, you don't have to distance yourself emotionally from your neighbors. You can stay in touch. Um, uh, when Sue and I go out for walks every day now, <clears throat> we encounter our neighbors at a safe distance, of course. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's good to know we're all in it together. A bar, a lounge, no, no good anymore, but a place to escape. Uh, those, we all need those places, you know, like Cheers, where, they, where you go, they know your name. Groups, teams, clubs, organizations, favorite activities, connection to music. That's a great stress reducer. Your favorite music, spiritual connection. I mentioned um, we have to be Episcopalian, but it's not. It, the spiritual connection is not uh, about memorizing catechism. It's about the relationship you make to whatever it is, whatever it is that's beyond knowledge and whatever you find there. That's your spiritual connection. Traditions, rituals, very important. A lot of those you can't exercise now. You can't. We can't go to church, so we have the uh, remote church and and traditions. Um, again, the tradition of shaking hands may have gone by the boards, but we'll invite. It will invent new new ones. And then, of course, connect, connection to work or school for children's school for adults' work. That's all changed now, and and. Uh, uh, but it's not disappeared, and it certainly will come back probably in different forms. Like in my own line of work, I think telepsychiatry will become a much bigger deal than it was before this uh, pandemic hit. In the next slide. Ah, we've come to the end of the slides. <laughs> you put your, put your questions in there. Let me just, let me just wrap up. Uh, by saying that that uh, uh, developing sort of a, a repertoire of of feeling comfort and offering comfort, giving and receiving comfort, realistic, not don't worry, be happy, nonsense comfort, but realistic comfort. I'm there for you. We're in this together. Uh, have a Zoom uh, cocktail party or have a Zoom. Uh, a uh, group session uh, discussion group or have a, you know, there are ways of coming together, offering one another uh, comfort, humor, laughter. It's okay to laugh these days. You know, don't dwell 
too much on the pandemic, but at the same time, don't deny it and uh, go through those three steps, you know, connect, get the facts, make a plan. And, and always remind yourself that you probably are exaggerating how vulnerable you feel, and you're probably underestimating how much control you have. So go to that cupboard of, of pockets of security. Go to what you can rely on, a friendship, a relationship, um, a pastime, a food. <laughs> you know, I'm going to rely on the beef stroganoff I'm going to eat tonight. You know, that will give me comfort. That will give me a few moments of comfort, and uh, I will relish that. And I will depend upon that. And they can't take that away from me, you know. And, and so, you know, whatever your pockets of comfort and coziness, wherever you can find them and create them, and then share them. And realize, yes, we are, as I said at the very beginning of this uh, webinar, we are in a dramatically changed world where there, it's, it's just bursting with suffering. But at the same time, we do have tools. We do have ways of... Uh, making good. We do have ways of climbing out of this, and we will. We absolutely will. And one of the ways we will is by reminding each other that we will, because one, one day one of us feels down and cynical and hopeless, but the other guy comes along and says, come on, we can do it. And that's how you do it. You do it uh, person by person, hand over hand, climbing up out of the well that we've fallen down into and uh, keeping, keeping your eyes on the sun up above and not the darkness down below. It, it, is, it is absolutely what we will do. And uh, that doesn't mean we deny the problem, not at all. Part of solving the problem is, is staring it straight on. But neither do we exaggerate the hold that it has over us. Neither do we cower in a corner and say, I give up. And the best way not to give up, again, is to take strength from others, to take, to, to take strength from your belief system, to take strength from, from others, to take strength from your memories of, of, of times you've overcome stuff in the past, and then to share, to share, to teach, to share, to lead, uh, uh, to, to come together in a big force field of, of problem-solving, loving energy. That's what we all can beam out to one another. And, and honest to goodness, I promise you, that's what will lead us to the, to the, to the positive solution that does await us. I don't know how soon, but I know I know for a fact it will come. Well, there's a number of questions, I think, and my friend uh, Wayne, I believe, has, has called through them, and, and let, let's answer as many as we can. Okay. Um, a couple of people have talked about they can't stop themselves from ruminating about the future, uh, which led to a question of the default mode network in ADHD brains, and I wondered if you could talk about that. Oh, Wayne, you know very well I can talk about that. <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite new topics, and this is straight out of uh, neuroscience, straight out of functional MRI. Uh, but it, it turns out that when, uh, when your imagination is not engaged in doing something constructive, when it's engaged in doing something constructive, what lights up are, are clumps of neurons in aggregate called the task positive network, the TPN. The task positive network, that's when you're problem solving. That's when you're in good worry. That's when you're in creative mode. That's when, for an ADD person, you're best. You're at your best when you're in the task positive network. But then whenever, it, whenever what you were doing is over, when you've finished and you have downtime, the brain does not go quiet. It does not go silent. Instead, what lights up is called the default mode network, the DMN, which I call the demon. Sounds like DMN, demon. But, you know, it, it is when it's active, it's your imagination. It's your greatest ally. But when it's not engaged in a positive, constructive task, it becomes your worst enemy. This demon just tends to unleash a stream of negative, ruminative, brooding, bleak, black, dire, you know, life is awful, I'm awful, everything's going to pot, everything's going to hell, nothing's going to work out, we're living through the final plague, uh, you know, this is the punishment for all our sins, and blah, 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 blah. Your imagination, it's coming from your imagination, <coughs> you are creating it, don't mistake it for truth. 
you are creating uh, the demon, and it, and it's absolutely uh, transfixing. The contentment is too bland. You don't say she was riveted in contentment, but you do say she was riveted in fear, despair, rumination, negative images of all kinds of bleakness and blackness. So what do you do about it? The answer is so simple, but it's very hard to do. The answer is don't feed the demon. And what are you feeding it with? Your attention. Don't give it your attention. You have to do something else, anything else, but do something to engage the task positive network, the TPN. So <clears throat> fry an egg. Or one of my favorites is just focus on your breathing, but you've got to do it in a very deliberate way. It's got to be a complicated <coughs> excuse me, breathing pattern in order to engage your imagination. So make it like three beats in, hold four beats, five beats out, hold three beats, then change it up, five beats in, hold two beats. You know, and, and you'll get yourself focusing on the changing breathing pattern, and that will shut off the DMN. You see, it's hard to do because the DMN is so seductive. That negativity, those fantasies of doom and gloom and misery and perdition are absolutely seductive and grossing and captivating. But you have the power to turn them off by doing something. And you got to do something. Like I say, <clears throat> fry an egg, focus on your breathing, write an email, turn on the TV, but it's got to be a, it's got to be a compelling show and, and uh, get out of the habit of feeding the demon. It is common among highly creative people with ADD, highly imaginative people. It's when their greatest asset, their imagination, becomes their worst enemy, the default mode network gone haywire. And, and my gosh, it's not amenable to medication. It's not amenable to uh, uh, standard forms of therapy, but it is amenable to the simplest intervention, namely do something else that engages your brain, your imagination enough to shut off the DMN, activate the TPN, the task positive network, to shut down the DMN, the default mode network. Okay, great answer. Uh, illuminating for me. Um, several people have talked about feelings of guilt. They've had some downtime. They're not able to go out, occupy their their time with restaurants or movies or this and that. And the guilt is, uh, you know, leading to some negative thoughts. Uh, guilt for not, this one woman says, guilt for not doing enough for my daughter with ADHD, guilt for being a bad wife, guilt for not accomplishing enough in a day because I don't have any energy right now because of the, uh, the coronavirus and my worries. So feelings of guilt, how does one deal with those in these tough times? Well, well, again, we need to cut ourselves some slack. We need to be kind to ourselves. Now, you can set that in motion by getting permission from someone you love to tell you that, because sometimes it's hard to tell yourself that. But get your spouse or whoever you talk to uh, to commiserate with you and say, you know, yeah, we just can't do as much. I, I feel spent. I feel worn out. And there is something fatiguing about this shelter at home. Uh, my wife and I both feel it. We're, we're tired. I wake up tired. And, and uh, um, you know, and, and I go through my day uh, combating uh, fatigue. It's, it's, it's wearing on the, on the body and the soul to be living in, you know, ongoing danger. It, it, it just is. It's tiring. And recognize that fact. You know, we're all living in uh, red alert, we're, we're living in danger. And that takes the toll, whether you have the infection or not, it, it, it wears down your body and your soul, your mind, your energy. So cut yourself some slack. And then the, the content of your guilty thoughts, that's the DMM. That's the default mode network. You know, that's uh, your imagination uh, attacking you your imagination, your greatest ally, becoming your worst enemy and sending you, you know, what, what mother, what's, what's her biggest hot button, her biggest source of guilt, not being a good enough mother. So, of course, your default mode network throws
throws that one at you. You're not a good enough mother. You haven't done enough for your child's ADD. You should learn more. You should read more books. You should be up on everything. You ought to do everything. Why haven't you, have you read that? Have you talked to that person? Why haven't you done more? You're not a good enough mother. And, and that's the default mode network laying into you. So you've got to say, no, I'm going to do something else. Don't fight with it because you will lose that argument. You cannot out-argue the default mode network because it's your creation. And it's always one step ahead of you. Uh, so don't engage it. Your best thing, your, in fact, your only tool is to don't feed it. Don't give it your attention. Don't say, yes, I'm so bad as a mother. Or argue with it. No, I'm not that bad. I did this thing the other day. I got her a tutor. Or I got No, don't engage it. Uh, say, I've used expletives here, but I don't want to pollute the airways. But, you know, <laughs> get lost, default mode network. Get get lost, Dean. Okay. You know, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna pay attention to you. And uh, and the feelings of guilt that you're entertaining is just the default mode network in action. So do something else. <laughs> Fry that proverbial <laughs> egg, or focus on your breathing, or or whatever it might be. And the DNN will disappear because those neurons will go quiet. But the the first point I made also: uh, cut yourself some slack. We all we're all feeling tired. We're all feeling, you know, kind of worn out. You, you just can't live in a, you know, in a, like the Brits during the Blitz, you know, being afraid of the next attack. You know, it was, they, they reported just feeling just brought down. And, and, but that's why we need each other to buck each other up. Now is the time to buck each other up, not with silly slogans like, don't worry, be happy but with real meaningful connection, real meaningful assistance, real meaningful Zoom cocktail party or, or whatever, whatever your way of doing it might happen to be. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, another woman uh, has said that she subscribed to the connect with people um, goal, but she tends to wind up pushing people away because she's oversharing her worries as she says ultimately it ends up overstressing friends and connections and pushing them away so is there any way to sort of take control while in a you know while trying to connect to not yeah I, you know my to, first go ahead my first reaction is are you sure about that because a lot of people think they're pushing people away when in fact they're not um a lot of people, uh, you know, they they just, they feel, oh, I shouldn't have said that, I overshared, and and they imagine or they perceive that they're being pushed away, we're pushing people away when in fact they're not. But if you are, if, you, if you're right, that you overshare in such a way that, you know, it becomes a burden to other people, then it's like any other habit that you need to work on. Be aware of it and try to do it less, you know, and, and uh, or spread the worry, you know, enlarge the circle of people that you share with, um, you know. And, of course, the, a dog, you can share everything, you know. You, you, you can just tell them every single last molecule of your worries, and the dog will just sit there and love you and lick you for it. So, so uh, but, but uh, you know, try to titrate it, and if you do get solid messages back that you're doing it too much, uh, a good fallback position is always to ask the other person what's going on with them. If you're if you're talking too much about yourself, uh, just catch yourself and say, "And what's up with you? How are you dealing with all this? What's what's going on with your family, your children, your grandparents, your work? I mean, you know, uh, there's a whole inventory. And so make a point of not talking about yourself at at at, at great length, and and then and then stop yourself and say. Tell me about you. And, and most people are glad to tell you about what's going on with themselves. And then you've, then you've got a connection. Then you've got sharing. Then you've got empathy. Then you've got instant feeling better, guaranteed instant feeling better. When you get the back and forth going, uh, both parties uh, will, will feel stronger, less vulnerable, more in control. And guess what? It has physical ramifications as well. Your immune system benefits from it. Your immune system really benefits from vitamin connect. And it suffers if you don't get it. And this is well proven. This is well proven. Social isolation is as bad for you as cigarette smoking. 
um, our previous Surgeon General named loneliness as the number one medical condition in the United States, and this was well before the the, the pandemic. So, so you know, the beauty is this is a variable that we can somewhat control, and we can get massive doses of vitamin connect every day if we commit ourselves to doing it. Uh, one mom is concerned about her. She wants to get her children to open up and talk about their thoughts and concerns and fears, but you know, they're isolating in their rooms and learning remotely and they're in another room doing that and they're not sharing their thoughts. So this sort of is a spin off of Vitamin Connect except with your own family. What how do you how do you engage them? Yeah, oftentimes kids aren't gonna respond to direct questions like tell me your feelings, like whoops, <laughs> he just lost that kid. So so what you wanna do is do projects together. Uh, bake a cake, uh, do a puzzle, um, build a model airplane, uh, uh, design a dress, um, you know, do a project together. And in the midst of that, they will tell you, they will volunteer what they're feeling. But if you sit down and say, okay, let's have a family meeting. How are we feeling about the pandemic? The kids will just clam up and they won't like it. They will squirm and it'll look, it's like they're in a dentist chair. Uh, you know, they, they, they won't. And if you, the more you pump them, the more closed they'll get. So, so the way to get someone talking is instead to let them talk. And you set the stage for conversation to be spontaneous. And the best way to do that is to have a shared activity. It could be even as something as simple as watching a TV show together and you schmooze during the commercial. But it doesn't have to be something like baking a cake or designing a dress. It can be something completely simple. Like uh, like watching a show together, um, or or eating dinner together. Food is another great connector. But but don't don't the direct question method is, is usually unless it's a very unusual kid uh, going to be met with silence and and pushback and 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 a desire not to sit down with you again, you know because because but but you can you can get them into a place they will spontaneously want to share by sharing a, an activity with them. That's good advice. I like the TV, making it a little less direct, watching the show yeah. together that you like. It's funny how things come out during those times. Um, yes. Several people very concerned uh, about acute anxiety. Uh, and one has asked, are breathing exercises the best way to go? A lot of people feeling some very strong anxiety. So I wanted to know, what are your thoughts about that? Well, anxiety, you know, is, is a natural and ubiquitous uh, part of, of life. And as I said uh, before, uh, signal anxiety is your warning system. So it's, it's your body's way of telling you danger may be near. The problem is the signal may be, may be a false signal. It's like the car alarm that goes off when, when no one is near the car. And, and that's what I call toxic worry or, or, or bad anxiety. And there are a lot of ways of dealing with it. My favorite, of course, is never worry alone. My favorite is connecting with a person, with a dog, with a piece of music. We went down that list of, of positive uh, ways to, to connect. Um, that's my favorite one. Uh, absolutely, breathing exercises can help. Physical exercise of any kind can help. And, and physical exercise is prophylactic. It's preventative. Uh, and you don't have to go to a gym. You know, my wife every day is exercising, does a whole routine. I don't because I'm a lazy guy, but she does. And uh, uh, she does her whole gym routine in our living room. And then uh, for the running part, she either runs around, we have a loop around inside, or if it's a nice day, she goes out and runs around the house a whole bunch of times. And um Physical exercise is a is a good in the acute moment. If you're feeling anxious, run up and down stairs a few times. It will absolutely change your brain chemistry. Or preventative maintenance, if you exercise regularly, you'll tend to be less anxious. And then, of course, there's pharmacology. And uh, the oldest uh, drug uh, to combat anxiety is alcohol. You know, wine, uh, uh, a glass or two of wine uh, can reduce anxiety. Uh, don't overdo it because then the cure is worse than the disease. Uh, but but alcohol is a is a good anti-anxiety agent. 
Uh, and then there are the benzodiazepines, uh, you know, like clonopin uh, and and um, watch out for them though, because they can become habit forming. Xanax can be a real scourge, particularly in the ADD population. And then the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the Prozacs and the Zolofs and the Lexapros and the Selexas, those are all so-called SSRIs and they can be helpful in treating uh, chronic anxiety. But don't go to those first. Really try to go the non-medication route first, uh, <clears throat> connection, meditation, breathing. Um, those will take care of most anxiety. Um, this one's a little tough. What is an easily, easy explanation to give a 10-year-old boy with ADHD and anxiety about when this COVID-19 thing may end? Is there any kind of, you know, non-anxious way to explain it to a kid? Well, I'm always a fan of just telling the truth. And, and so you say, we don't know. And then see how he responds. You see, follow his, follow his reaction. If he freaks out, you say, well, but we've got, we've got tools to deal with it. We have smart people looking into it. Um, uh, and if, he's, if he says, well, why don't we know? Well, we, we don't know because we don't know. We don't have the science to predict. Uh, but if people continue to follow proper protocol and do the, you know, the shelter at home and wear masks and, and don't jump the gun and go back to work too soon, um, you know, it, sh it should end, uh, let's hope, uh, the, before the end of the year. And let's hope by Thanksgiving. Let's hope by Halloween. Uh, if we get really lucky, maybe by the 4th of July, but <clears throat> we're always hoping. Um, but, you know, I think it's a bad idea to lie. You can always, and, and then when you share it, you're not worrying alone. So you can, you can say to him uh, with his anxiety and ADD, um, let's talk about it. You know, it, it, what's it like living in danger? And then, and then you begin to say, well, what defenses do you have? What can you, what can you rely on? Well, you can rely on mom and dad. You can rely on the fire department. You can rely on the hospital and the doctors. You can rely on uh, people looking really hard for a vaccine and, uh, and treatments and, and new ideas are coming up all the time. So it's not like it's bleak. It's not like we're powerless, but no, we don't have the definitive solution as yet. Um, but remember, we live, we li we've lived forever with another unsolvable problem that is attached to uncertainty, namely death. Uh, we manage to live with the fact we're all going to die without going cuckoo every day with, with anxiety, you know. And, and, and so <clears throat> there is an adaptive nature to compartmentalizing uh, problems. And we all kind of put death in a, in a special place and don't dwell on it too much. And, and when we do, we all have our various answers to it. But uh, uh, this particular question of how to tell someone when the pandemic will end I think you begin with the truth, which is we don't know, and then see where that leads you. And together, you can cobble together probably a pretty satisfying uh, uh, solution that both of you can live with. Um, a lot of questions about because, because spouses are um, at home together, um, which is sort of a new normal for a lot of them because people are out working and shopping. They're not together quite as much. Um, several spouses have talked about strong emotions, emotional intensity with ADHD, and one is finding that her husband is, uh, you know, subject to sort of fits of anger about small things that she hadn't really seen before. Um, so I was wondering, um, the, whole, the whole idea of ADHD filtered through this COVID, strong emotions in ADD filtered through the COVID-19 lens. I mean... Any any suggestions about trying to keep your emotions somewhat in stabilized? Yeah, it's a good time to sort of learn about each other in, in these more intimate and stressful quarters. And, uh, you know, my analogy for ADD is that you've got a Ferrari engine for a brain with bicycle brakes. And, you know, so you have this passion, this, this drive, this uh, imagination, you know, this powerful, powerful brain but your brakes aren't strong enough to contain it. Now, the beauty of that model is she can say to her husband, honey, 
your brakes are failing you. Instead of attacking him and saying you've got an anger problem or fleeing him and, and trying to avoid him, uh, the brake analogy is, com- is not accusatory. It's you've, we, you've got to work on your brakes. And it's your brain is so powerful. Average brakes can't hold it. You know, so, so you know, it's, it's sort of a compliment. You know, you, you've got such dynamism. You've got such energy. You've got such power. But your brakes sometimes fail you, and you can get really angry in ways that I know you don't want to do. I know you don't want to explode. I know you don't want to hurt me or the kids. I know you don't want to blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then you put it in a, in a break analogy. There's no shame in that. It's just you need a good mechanic. You need someone to strengthen your brakes. It's not a moral failing. It's not condemning. It's not, you know, you've got to go to anger management class or something. You know, it, it's, it's, it's breaks. And then, you know, then you can find help. You know, I'm like me. I'm a brake specialist. That's what I do. I help people strengthen their brakes, whether they're six years old or 60 years old. And uh, getting your ADD treated in, in various ways, whether it's coaching or exercise or medication or, or environmental engineering, you know, all of that can help. But you want to begin by, by having, having him understand himself a little better during these days, framing it in a way that he doesn't feel ashamed, but also in a way that it, it, it says there, there's an issue to deal with, but we can deal with it. It's not just try harder. You know, there are ways to strengthen your brakes other than just resorting to willpower. Mm-hmm. Several people here feel very isolated. Um, A lot of single parents with ADHD raising kids with ADHD. Um, Sort of a tough equation there. I just didn't know uh, any advice you might be able. I mean, who could they draw on for strength if they, you know, if they're struggling? Well, there are a lot of chat rooms out there. I know Attitude has one, and uh, Terry Matlin in Michigan has some wonderful ones for women with ADD. Uh, if you just Google chat rooms for people with ADD, you'll you'll find lots of them, and that's a a wonderful use of our of our technology is to uh, go on to go into chat rooms and and you can uh, get support, help, tips, reminders, uh, recommendations. Um, you know, I, I I would immediately tell people to go to these chat rooms and the ones that I know about. I know. You guys have one, Wayne. I know Terry Matlin has one, and there's many others that I that I don't know about. But it's all part of Never Worry Alone. And, and if you're a parent with kids, uh, you, you you definitely don't want to be worrying alone. That's when bad things happen. That's so. Uh, go on to a chat room. Uh, get Attitude Magazine. Uh, buy one of my books or one of the many other books that are out there by by people who can give you information and. And information and knowledge helps you feel more powerful, less vulnerable, to go back to my, my basic equation. But uh, whatever you do, don't sit there worrying alone, saying nobody is in my situation. There are millions of people in your situation, and there is plenty of help, help. And the help begins by connecting. That's where it begins. And then, and then the positive spiral ensues, and you feel better. Believe me, you will. If You absolutely will if you do that. Well, thanks very much, Ned. I think the hour is up or close to up. And um, really, thanks so much for being here. Wonderful advice and strategies. Uh, I'm sure everyone appreciates your uh, your being here today and helping them. So thank well, you it again. Was, it, was, it was absolutely my pleasure. And, and as always, Wayne, you and, and the whole Attitude team, Susan, and all the rest of you, Lily, uh, you just do wonderful, wonderful work, and uh, uh, and I must say, Wayne, you have about the most soothing voice I've ever heard. It's so calm. You you really you have a a, a really remarkably calming voice. <laughs> well, I've never heard that before, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ned. Really. Sure. And, yeah. and have a great day. Thank you. You and too, and every... all of you listening. Yep. Yes. Thanks for to all of the attendees for listening in. Uh, we'll see you this Thursday on April 23rd when Sharon Celine will talk about fixing your family's morning routine and finding solutions to your worst ADHD schedule problems. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.